I've been doing a series out of the book of Ephesians uh, called The Glory of Christ in His Church. And so each week I have a, like a, a sub-message. And so I started last week called His Dwelling Place. And um, obviously if you weren't here to kind of really pick up where I'm at today, because this will be a part two, His Dwelling Place part two, you can go back and watch or listen to that. So I'm in Ephesians chapter 2. I'll be finishing up in Ephesians 2 today. And so I'm just going to recap for a moment where I was at last week. I looked at last week Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, and verses 14 through 18. Now, just to summarize, so Paul is writing to a Gentile audience, those who were not of Jewish birth or faith, and he's telling them, that they are now, because of what Christ has done, the blood of Christ being shed, that they have, those who were far away have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. And I use this illustration of two rivers. I use the example, I was down in Brazil years ago, down in the Amazon area of Brazil and near a city, Manaus, and there's two large rivers that come together, the Amazon River that comes out of Peru, and then the Negro River that sort of comes out of the north. And the two come together together, and at first, uh, the one river is very dark, and, and the Amazon a little lighter. And so you, you, you can see the very distinct characteristics of each river. But within just a short distance downstream in the Amazon, now it's just one big Amazon river, it all is the same water color, right? And so this is exactly what Jesus has done for us, this type of metaphor of taking the two. You have the stream of all the promises to ancient Israel, to the Jewish people, starting back Abraham and and uh, you know, then you know, the Abrahamic covenant, then the Mosaic covenant, all of these promises to Israel. And now the Gentiles, a smaller river, but being grafted in, they all are one. And Paul was telling them here in Ephesians 2 that now in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, Galatians 3.28, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. So he's talking about this great... Uh, conf confluence, if you will, of the ages, of the, of the promises made to Israel and now to the Gentiles. And he's saying, listen, you were once strangers to the covenant promises, but not any longer. And so now you have a hope, you're not without God any longer, and through Jesus you've been brought news near. And so, again, as I shared last week, the good news of the gospel is that everyone is welcome and has hope through Jesus. And then further, as Paul continued in this thought, how Christ has become our peace. Uh, this is again Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. And how he and himself made one new humanity out of the two, making peace. And he removed this wall of hostility. And to understand that, in the Jewish temple area, they had an outer court area, which was known as the court of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were not allowed to get uh, in the inner court area or come and participate in Jewish worship. And so, in fact, there were signs in, in uh, uh, both Latin and Greek that, listen, if you, if you get near, you, you could be stoned to death, right? And so, now, and so Paul is speaking very clearly to them. They would have understood this. Listen, you don't have to be afraid any longer. You can get near because of what Christ has done and that good news. And so I carried that thought out how uh, this whole ingathering of all people uh, took place. Now, let's pick up now in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, and I want to unpack this understanding of this uh, being his dwelling place uh, or the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So now Paul says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. I, I believe this is one of the most important understandings for the church to have is that how through Christ we are being built together a literal dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And, uh, oh, I just need to remember, I need to make one more announcement. By the way, if you're interested in ministering to some youth at Tucson High this week, see Frank Kimberling 
or Barbara Patterson, they're going to go minister to the youth at Tucson High, okay? Sorry about that. Forgot about that. And uh, anyways, so this is an, uh, an amazing thing. Now, God is after something beyond just brick or mortar. You realize that, right? And I'll unpack that more in a minute. And so he's really saying to the, to the Gentiles, and that's to us, he's saying, you are no longer a foreigner. You're no longer a refugee seeking asylum, living in a distant land, with no rights as a citizen, but now you are citizens and members of God's kingdom. With full rights, God's promise is to care for you in his kingdom. Now, it, it really, and I'll just segue for a moment, but to understand the totality of a kingdom, in ancient times when kings and kingdoms were, were very prevalent, a good king, a benevolent king, cared for not just his subject, but the people of the community or in his kingdom. He cared for them. In other words, if they were doing well, it reflected well on the king, right? And so if they were prosperous, if they were healthy, if they, if they were free of famine and poverty, they weren't being overtaxed, all these type of things, it, it was a good sign of, of the king and how well he was doing. And so in, in a real way, Jesus, our wonderful Savior, Lord, King, Father God, all of this, Listen, he is the most loving, benevolent king. Would you agree? And he is not looking to lord over. He is looking to love and bless and draw us near to him and care for us. He's very much concerned about our welfare. Now, in this passage, so back to this passage, Paul switches the metaphors to that of a building, a literal dwelling place in the spirit, which is built upon the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Now, to understand this a little more, the temple was the heart of Jewish nation, or, the, or not just worship, but it was also the social center, the political center. The temple was at the very heart of all that there was in Judaism at that time. And the primary reason was that Israel's God, Yahweh, had promised to live there. And many believed, and of course we believe it's true, it was the place where heaven and earth met, where God met with his people, right? And so now Paul is declaring that the living God is constructing a new temple. It consists not of stones, arches, pillars, and altars, but of human beings. And as I shared last week, it, it, it wasn't about outward signs of profession of faith. It wasn't about circumcision, right? It was about the circumcision of the heart. It was about true worship unto the king, right? And so this is what Paul is trying to unpack this even more. It, it, listen, it's not about the stones, the arches. It's about a new temple that God is doing. And so now what's interesting is some ancient Jews and scholars, they'd already explored the idea that the community, that in a community rather than the, a building or the temple might be the place where God would really and truly take up his residence. But until Paul came along, there was nobody that really put it on paper and actually articulated it and saying, listen, no, God is after something besides just a physical building here. And so God is now seeking to make his home in the hearts and lives and the communities that have declared their loyalty to Jesus and were determined to live by the gospel. And that's still true for us today. Now, the early apostles and former prophets, they laid a foundation. And what's interesting also, at that time, there was when they would build temples or buildings or archways or whatever, a lot of times they would get stones from different quarries. And so some scholars believe that Paul was also sort of referencing that you had this sort of apostolic stone carved out of one quarry, one color, and this prophetic stone sort of carved out of another quarry, and the two are being put together. But what holds it together in ancient times, and even still in some construction today, uh, a headstone or a cornerstone is what would hold an arch together, it would hold that there was that tension there, and it would just fit all right together, or a building. And so Jesus is that chief cornerstone, he's the headstone, the peak of the building, keeping all the other stones in place. Everybody say, it's all about Jesus. Amen? And so we thank God for those early apostles, those prophets. They've laid a foundation. Uh, but it's all about Jesus and what he has done. And so God is creating in the church a dwelling place of his presence 
and his glory. This is what he's after. Again, let me read that scripture again. He's in verse 21, Ephesians 2. He says, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. He wants a holy temple, right? And verse 22, and in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, Peter would say it this way in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 6. He says that we are coming to him as to a living stone. You also, as, a, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, God's creating in the church a dwelling place of his presence and glory. We're being fitted together as living stones so that a dwelling of His Spirit could be attained. I've shared this story slash vision over, you know, several times over the years. But several years ago, about 12 years ago, we began the construction of this, of this building. I was well, actually about 13 years ago. Finished it 11 years ago. And uh, we were going through a tough time. It was during the, that really tough recession back in 2008, 2009. And I was praying one day, and different things had happened. The contractor had declared bankruptcy. We were about 75% done on the construction of this building. Finances were tight, all of these things. And I was out walking and praying one day. It was actually up on Mount Lemon. It was uh, when the weather was a little warmer. And I was up there walking, and I'm just praying. I'm saying, God, just show me. Lord, what's your heart on this? You know, Lord, we just need a breakthrough. And the Lord, I just began to have this very simple little vision. I saw the Lord like in the ponderosa pines, and all of a sudden I just got a glimpse of him like with a, an apron on, a leather apron, like something a construction worker would use. And by the way, carpenters back in that time were often uh, stonemasons, okay, not just wood like we would think of today. And so I saw the Lord actually working on a wall, and his arms are kind of big and strong, and he's just working, he's laying these stones in place, and he just looks up at me, he's got a plumb line, and he goes, Bob, I want my building built. And he smiled, and he just kept going back to work. How many of you know this is Jesus' house, right? <laughs> It's, it's all about him putting it together. And then recently, a couple months ago, I was praying one morning. Obviously, this building was constructed, all of this. I saw, he reminded me of the same vision. He looked at me this time, he smiled, and he goes, Bob, I want my church built. <laughs> Come on, I want everybody to hear this. Jesus has never stopped laying living stone upon living stone. He's the master carpenter, the master builder. He's putting it in place, and that's you and I. And sometimes, if you ever notice with Jesus, he likes to chisel a little bit. Some of you aren't so sure. If you haven't had it happen, believe me, it'll happen. And you know, when you're a living stone, you don't like something cutting against you, right? But the Lord is working. Iron sharpens iron. He is working with each of us to mold us and to shape us. And, and of course, he puts a value on local churches, but there's a capital C church of which we're all a part of. And so we all have a different function, a different role, and he's putting us in place in local bodies or across the globe and connected, you know, uh, you know across time, is, in fact, with the capital C church. And so there we are, and we're all alive because of what Jesus did. Now remember, Jesus, at the beginning of this, chapter 2 of Ephesians, he said you once were dead, but now you are alive because of what Christ has done. You see, we're a living stone, we're alive because Jesus has made us alive, right? And so he is bringing us together. Now, Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 6.19, read out of the NIV, he'd also share something similar in 1 Corinthians 3.16. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. Amen. You could say that you're possessed. <laughs> Hold on, I better be careful here. God himself has chosen, when we give our lives to Christ and through new birth, he has chosen to dwell in our hearts. He has made us alive. We are baptized, as I shared last week, by one spirit into one body. The spirit has done this. When we said yes to Jesus and we had that born again moment, 
All of a sudden, we became made new because we believed his word and, and what was said about his death and his resurrection, right? And how his precious blood is the gift that cleanses us and forgives us of our sin. All of a sudden, we're made new and the spirit of God dwells within us. As imperfect as we are, he is in us. Our bodies are not our own any longer. And of course, Paul was exhorting them to live a holy life if you carry on in that passage. But the dwelling, God is after a dwelling of his spirit. It starts with you and I individually. You remember the story of Gideon? Let me segue a little bit. You remember the story of Gideon back in Judges chapter 6? And, you know, the, the nation of Israel had gone apostate, and, and uh, all of a sudden God decides he's going to use Gideon as a deliverer. And, Gideon's like, you got the wrong guy. I'm the least in my father's house. My father's house, the least of all the tribes in Benjamin, etc. And then all of a sudden, after Gideon finally says yes to the Lord, he goes through all this thing. We read in Judges 6.34 that the Spirit of the Lord came on upon Gideon. And did you know the, liberal, the literal Hebrew of that literally could read, the Spirit of Yahweh clothed himself with Gideon. Now this is the Old Testament. The Spirit of God literally clothed himself with Gideon. Do you realize that God wants to use you and I to literally, not only us to be indwelt by him, but us to be kind of used by him? Amen. And so I want to ask you a little question. If our individual lives are the temple of God, filled by the Spirit, how much more should we expect the church to be the temple of God? If God would fill a temple with his glory, you remember after the construction of that temple, that first temple there in Jerusalem under Solomon's reign, it, it was filled with the glory of God. The musicians, they couldn't even stand because the presence of God was so strong. If God would fill a temple with his glory so the priests couldn't stand, how much more in our new covenant error? When we allow God to build us into his dwelling place, people encounter the living God. Families, when you... Husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, when you allow your hearts to be one with one another in the living God and you create a place of the dwelling of God for your children, what happens? Your house becomes the dwelling place of God. It becomes an altar of the Almighty, if you will. The cure to some of the problems in our society is for our families once again to become the dwelling place of God. For my single moms or parents out there, you can create the same environment. You can become a dwelling of God. The Spirit of God dwells within you. For my grandmothers and, and grandfathers, you're praying for your, you know, your wayward children or grandchildren. You can create an atmosphere that becomes the dwelling place of God that will affect them. And imagine for a moment, congregations like ours all over this nation, began to get a revelation of just how powerful it is to pursue the presence of God and believe that the Spirit of God wants to manifest in a way that would affect not only our families to change the course and the trajectory of their lives, but would affect our communities. Can you imagine what that would be like? You see, what happens when we create a dwelling place of God, people encounter the living God. They give their lives to Christ. They find freedom. They find healing. They find family. They find purpose. When the church arises with Christ's vision for the world, the world begins to get impacted by his love and his power. I've been in meetings around the world, some here in the United States, some in this church, where God's presence and glory was so mighty that Many came to Christ and many were healed. Uh, one of the most dramatic, I'm speaking for my families today, dramatic meetings I've ever been where I saw families encounter was one night on a Monday night down in Brazil. The largest Baptist church in down in Brazil, Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And we had been in another part of Brazil earlier that weekend ministering our team and we flew in on that Monday to, to, to that city and we're at, you know, arranged to do a meeting there. The, the church was so large, it was like a church, 20, I don't know what the size of the church is now, but it was like 20,000 at the time. They had like three different sanctuaries, and so they put us in the small sanctuary that would seat about 2,000 people, and there was about 1,500 people there that night on a Monday night. Now, the thing about, have you ever noticed on what, Monday nights are Monday nights everywhere around the world. 
People are tired, it's back to work, all that kind of stuff, right? And so we get there to this meeting. We're all tired. We traveled, ministered all weekend. And, uh, you know, the worship team, it was good, but honestly, it was a little flat. I say that kindly. <laughs> Preaching was a little flat. Dear friend, our overseer, Randy Clark, was speaking, and it was, he was just kind of, you know, it was, it was all right. So we just kept praying. Don't look at me now. I hope it's not flat right now, okay? And uh, so we just start praying. Well, about 20 minutes into his message, that didn't seem very inspired, and the worship didn't seem very inspired, all of a sudden, God began to move sovereignly. There was no invitation. There was no altar call. There was no, you know, just as I am or whatever. It was just some preaching that didn't seem real on point or whatever, and all of a sudden, I, this is what I'll never forget as long as I live. I saw one family after another with their kids, dads and moms, weeping and groaning and crying out, and the kids crying out, and they began to just, boom. One, there was like six of them all of a sudden right in the And I start looking, and people are just all over the place on their faces beginning to cry out to God. Other people are just under the power of the Spirit and God's move. I'm like, and he just stops. Finally, he just stops. Somebody says, God's here, and if you don't know Christ, come forward if you need healing. And it's just the place just erupted. Okay? Listen, when God comes, when we create a place of the dwelling of God, and, it, it, we, and sometimes it comes, he comes in the least likely moments, all of a sudden it can impact. I wonder to this day, those families that were dedicating their children, their lives, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wonder to this day how those kids, are, maybe some of them are ministry right now, who knows, but all I know is that night there was an encounter that families and others were having because of the presence of God and because someone created a place for the dwelling of God. Are you with me? It's like, God, may we see it again in our churches in America. Where it's not, we're just looking at the clock. It's like, how soon can I get out of here? God, I, I, I want to stay until you meet with me. So let me ask you some questions. What do you think it means to be the dwelling place of God? So I'm going to go through a couple things. First, let me, let me start in, at a place called Bethel back in Genesis. And so what does it mean to be the dwelling place of God? First of all, what does it look like? And so... One of the first times in Scripture is here in Genesis that we hear anything about the dwelling of God. And for time, I may not read the whole passage here, but it starts in Genesis 28, about verse 10. Now, you know the story. You've got Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. And Jacob has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob gets the blessing, kind of steals a birthright from his brother Esau. Esau is a little upset. And Jacob basically is sort of kind of running and... In the midst of his sort of scheming, and his mother kind of was helping him on this whole thing, God visits him. And this is the amazing thing with God. He will sometimes visit us even when we're not walking the most righteously. But God's, God's got a plan and a purpose, and he knew what he would do through Jacob would later be named Israel. And all of a sudden, he's out there in sort of the desert area there of modern-day Israel near a place called Beersheba, and he's there all night, and all of a sudden he has this dream, and he, in this dream he sees a ladder ascending towards heaven. He sees angels ascending and descending on it, verse 12, Genesis 28. And then all of a sudden he sees the Lord standing at the top, and he hears the Lord speak, and maybe this was the first time Jacob ever heard the Lord. He says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. So now the Lord is reaffirming the Abrahamic covenant with Jacob, just as he did with Abraham and with his father Isaac. And God's reaffirming it to him, even though he, quote, stole the birthright from his brother. And he goes on to tell him, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I'll bring you back to this land. And verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep and says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And then verse 17, Genesis 28, 17 is just amazing. And he was afraid. You see, sometimes the presence of God can cause a holy fear. And it's good. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. 
Testament. First reference is the house of God. That English word house comes from a Hebrew word bait. It can mean house, dwelling, temple, palace. This is none other than the dwelling of God. This is where God is. This is the temple of God. And what's happening? He has a visionary encounter in our modern culture. We're uh, afraid of, quote, charismatic experiences or, or, or visions or these type of things. And, and again, there's re, you know, we need to line everything up with Scripture, that type of thing. Yes. But God still communicates in ways, and he reveals himself in ways that are beyond just what we may understand, right? And so one of the hallmarks of the house of God is a place of the presence of God and supernatural activity. He hears God's voice. He sees angels ascending and descending. So this is the gate of heaven. He goes on and he makes a vow to the Lord saying, if you'll be with me and keep me, I'll, I'll give me bread to eat and everything. So that I come back to my father's house in peace, and the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. He's so touched by God, he's like, I'm going to give you 10% back to you, God, whatever I have. Because I know that you've impacted me. Different. So what does the house of God or the dwelling place of God look like? A place of God's presence. It may be a reverential fear of God, supernatural activity, hearing the voice of God, visions, etc. Secondly, again, what does it mean to be the dwelling place of God? Recognize this is the Father's desire individually and corporately. Again, as I shared, if our bodies are the very temple of God, then we should not doubt that we're going to experience God's presence. You see, it would be a strange thing not to experience the presence of God or not to hear the voice of God. Every day, I expect to hear God's voice. I expect to have communion with Him. I expect to have an experience with God and encounter Him. Yes, I read the Word, and yes, God speaks through the Word, but God will also just rest. His presence will rest and touch us as well. Amen. You see, here's the mystery. God desires not only to dwell with humanity, but to live in humanity by His Spirit. Remember what the prophet Isaiah told us, Isaiah 66, verse 1. He tells us that heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? We could build a 100,000-seat auditorium here in Tucson. And it's not going to be big enough for what God wants to do, right? Thank God for buildings. Thank God for all the blessings and sound and lights, all these things he gives us, and we can meet. It makes it easier. But he's after something far more than brick and mortar. So the answer to where is the house you will build for me, it's in our hearts. And through unity with each other in his church. Remember, I talked again a lot about this last week. The true circumcision is that of the heart. Remember what happened to those early disciples, Jesus has been resurrected. He's appearing, talking to them and everything. And for 40 days, and all of a sudden, he's going to ascend. In Acts 1.8, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem till they're endued with power. And so they wait for another 10 days. They're praying. They're, they're waiting. And all of a sudden, the Feast of Pentecost occurs. And we pick up. And, and now we've got people from nations from all over the place. And Acts 2, uh, verse 1 through 4. And, and again, we shared a lot about this last week. How God is looking to bring in from every nation, every tongue, every tribe into the one large convergence of the one new humanity that's it through Christ, right? And so on this day of Pentecost, it says when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, so there's this unity there. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I'd so like to have that happen today. Well, pastor, that was only for Pentecost. No, church history records many occurrences were gone. Yes, there was only one Pentecost, but there are many blasts from heaven since then, okay? Fill the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The building and the believers gathered became a dwelling place of God. 
Again, what was happening? Supernatural activity. The Spirit of God is moving and, and blowing and breathing, and, and God is just doing something. God is there. And if you've ever been in a meeting where the presence of God is really strong, you know as you know He's here. It's like He just walked in. <laughs> Sometimes I sense it in the worship. It's like, oh, he just, oh, He's here. He just settled. It's not that He wasn't here before. But his presence, all of a sudden, it goes to another place. I've seen it with families praying. When they dedicate husbands and wives, when they're one in the Spirit, husbands loving the wives as Christ loved the church, and, and wives loving their husbands in honor and respect, all, and there's a unity there, and there's a, it, it all becomes palatable, the presence of God, the anointing of God, and how that can affect our youth and our children. That's what we're after. But you guess, guess what happened in Jerusalem? That little building where they were at couldn't contain the presence and glory of God. You see, the entire city became a dwelling place of God. All of a sudden, Peter begins to preach about Jesus and his resurrection. The Holy Spirit convicts people of their sins. They cry out, what must we do to be saved? Oh, that the city of Tucson. What must we do to be saved? And what's Peter? Acts 2.38, he stands up. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism doesn't save. It's repentance, faith in Christ. Baptism then is a spiritual sign of what Christ has done for us. But when that act happens, all of a sudden, of repentance and recognizing that Jesus died for our sins and all of a sudden now new life happens and what is it? You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. By one spirit have you been baptized into one body. And what happened on that day as a city became the dwelling place of God? 3,000 people came to Christ. And the church as we know it was birthed. One of our greatest evangelists in American history a man by the name of Charles Finney lived in the 1800s. God would visit in such a way as he really got going in his ministry. and it was just amazing. I was listening to some accounts this week. You know, he, this one place, Rome, New York, became such a place of the dwelling of God that anyone, they said you could literally, you'd walk into the city limits and all of a sudden you could feel the weight of God, the conviction. There was like an awe and a fear over that city. People, you know, one account of a tavern owner, owner that was, you know, mocking God, all these kind of things. He had to go to Rome to do business. And Finney gives the account as the man came literally across the, the edge of the city, into the city. All of a sudden, the weight of God came on. Within a couple of days, that man was gloriously saved, gave his life to Christ. You know, I just got to, we support some missionaries down in Brazil, the Aaron Borgos. And they didn't know I was going to be talking about the dwelling of God this week, and they sent me this little note. And, um, you know, this is down, so they're, they're right on the headwaters of the Amazon in Peru. And there's a lot of witchcraft there. And there was a young woman they wrote about here a couple months ago in a newsletter, Pilar, who radically got saved. And this Pilar and some others took what they knew about Christ and shook a city a little village on the Amazon. I'm going to read this. It'll just take a moment. Pilar, we need your help. Can you come? This urgent message came in from San Mateo, a village in the Datum, re Datum region of the Amazon jungle. The villagers were in terrible trouble. Black magic was taking over the entire village of 150 people. Sinister witches had allured the young people into its practice. Now, you may think we're free of all that kind of stuff here, but I guarantee you there's a whole lot of occult stuff going on. And I don't need to tell you about how bad the drugs are and all that kind of stuff, and, and the root of that is occult practice, okay? These influencers were kidnapping other youths to force them to participate in satanic rituals making pacts with the devil. If the kidnapped person resistant, resisted, they threatened to kill their family members. No one dared to resist the wave of evil sweeping over the community. You may remember Pilar's testimony from two or 
few of our earlier newsletters. She got radically saved and is now in full-time ministry. She and her fiery team were ready. So this would be the equivalent of us leading one of the gang leaders or drug dealers to Christ, and they get radically saved, and now they're going to become our assault team, our A team, to go whatever darkest part of Tucson to break things open, right? She and her fiery team were ready. They fasted. Listen, if, if fasting, if, if the church, the modern church in America could come back to the disciplines of Christianity, they fasted for seven days. After that week of focused prayer, they set off down the river for the village so in need of his delivering power. Their small vessel nearly sank several times. You see, they weren't going to be daunted by every scheme of the enemy, right? Every inch forward, the team could feel the spiritual resistance coming against them. The enemy did not succeed. The gates of hell will never prevail against the church of the Lord. Pursuing through, they made it to San Mateo. Arriving, they visited the chief. Now, he had been deeply involved in the occult practices going on. To their great surprise, he agreed to call his people to meet with the visiting missionaries. The team continued to fast. That, fast, that first evening, they met with people. An intense, visible darkness settled over the village. It looked like an immense tropical storm was about to begin. However, nothing further happened. They were able to begin sharing the gospel with the people. For three nights in a row, they preached with great conviction. The third night, a supernatural light began to visibly illuminate the whole place. The power of God fell. The young people, this is not from 100 years ago. This was like just recently down in Brazil, down in uh, Peru. The young people came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The witches and witch doctors of the village came forward, renouncing their dark practices and giving their lives to Jesus. Right and left, precious souls were getting delivered from the power of the evil one. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Last. By the end of the visit, the entire village had surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. Come on, church. That's the gospel. Oh, Pastor, it's not possible in our modern era, era in America. Yeah, it is. If, if the church will humble herself, repent, any compromise, sin, turn face towards heaven once again, 2 Chronicles 7.14, and say, God, we are not going to stop short of anything but a holy visitation with the city of God, where the city of Tucson becomes a dwelling place of God. Yeah, let's call it the city of God, okay? Right? And when that begins to grip churches and pastors, and we're not just worried about, you know, the next pizza party for the youth, and I'm good for all of that stuff, right? We had a good one last night for them. Look, look we're not just worried about the next program. We're not just worried about, you know, how good things look or how just precise the worship is or how tidy the message is. But it's like we want God. We want the presence of God. I want to see the city shaken. I want to see when they, this team goes to Tucson High this week. I want to hear about teenagers giving their life to Christ. Because there were some people that said, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, we're going to go in there and share the gospel with them. I, I don't, they've gotten permission to go in there. Pray for them. If you can't go and be part, pray for them. Thirdly, it requires a commitment to the presence of God. I'm almost done for today. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, guide, and friend. His goal is to mold us into the image of Jesus, that Jesus would radiate through us more and more, that we reflect God's presence more and more. This requires our submission to his word and the truth of his word. I, I love the fact, and I shared this a couple weeks ago as we were going through Ephesians 1, how the Holy Spirit's been given as a guarantee, Arabon, or down payment of, you will, a foretaste of the eternal life that's both now and yet to come. I love that. But you see, the truth is also we're to follow him. Jesus said, if you're my disciples, pick up your cross daily and follow after me. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, hey, and he's warning them, he goes, look, some of you will say to me in that day, you know, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And Jesus said, I'm going to say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, we can have enough gospel, we can have enough Christianity to be inoculated from the truth of what it really means to be born again and to walk with Jesus Christ. That should put a fear in the heart of people, not out of fear, am I going to lose myself? But no, listen, stay close to him, live in him. People ask me, once saved, always saved. He said, yeah, uh, yeah, this is my answer. In Christ, you're eternally secure. Amen. Live in Christ. Amen.
Stay in Christ. And if you wander, be quick to repent. Run back to the Father. And he stands with his arms open wide. Come back to me. If you're living in some kind of secret sin or compromise, say, God, I want this out of my life. And every Sunday morning across America, there's enough compromise. And I mean, I shared this here a couple weeks ago. You know, there was one, one recent poll. It's, it's a staggering, the numbers of, in pornography and sexual addiction and things. In 2019, one of, the, one of the porn sites had 42 billion hits on it. And it's rampant in the church. God wants to burn out everything that is contrary to His way. If we want to see the power of God, we want to see our teenagers get free, if we want to see our families rescued, if there's any chance that our nation can avoid a total implosion in the years to come, it's going to take a grassroots reawakening of the church in America. Which means, I want to be a holy temple. I want to be a holy priest. I don't want to just do church. You see, we don't need more religion. <laughs> Jesus said, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You should be filled. We're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness in a lot of our churches because we're not walking in righteousness. He's wanting to bring us back to that place. Jesus would finish his Sermon on the Mount after warning them. He says, a wise person hears my words and obeys them. He goes, it's like building a house on the rocks. You're going to withstand the storm. But a foolish person ignores my words, doesn't obey them. It's like building your house on the sand. Listen, the reason we have so many Gen Z and millennials turning away from Christ, they've had enough of the truth of the gospel to get them sort of feeling good, but yet they're not building their house on the solid rock. Right. Jesus, it's going to take your presence there is warfare that's come against us in ways, yeah, we may not have witchcraft like that down in Peru, but I guarantee you there's enough of what the enemy is doing, and I think most of us in our churches don't recognize what's happening. There is a battle, and if we don't engage and say, Jesus, we know you are amazing and you have conquered over all, and we're going to submit, we're going to humble, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, we're going to declare your word, we're going to go after until we see heaven break open. Jesus. Paul would later tell the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you have been sealed until the day of redemption. So on one hand, we've been given the Holy Spirit as a down payment. It's amazing. It's beautiful. We thank you, Holy Spirit. And yet we're told not to grieve him. Well, if Paul would warn about grieving him. It's obvious he knew some were grieving him. James tells us, James 1.27, he says, look, pure and undefiled religion is to minister the orphans and widows and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. We want to live in a place of holiness with you, God, so your presence. It requires a commitment to the presence of God. If we want to be the dwelling place of God, Jesus, we want all of you. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Last principle requires a commitment to corporate unity, house of prayer, purity, holiness. Again, separated from wrong motives and sin where everyone is welcome. And as I shared last week, Jesus was inclusive, but he was not affirmational. He welcomed people but did not affirm their sin. He practiced transformational inclusiveness. Come to me just as you are. I love you. I died for you. My grace is sufficient. Come to me and allow my spirit to transform you. Allow my word to make a change in your life. When we commit, his house is a house of prayer for all nations. When we commit to being a people of prayer, we stay in close contact with God. Our lives change. His word comes alive in our hearts. Obeying him and following the leading of the Holy Spirit becomes easy. Could I have a keyboard player come on up? You see, what begins to happen is, I think a lot of our prayers are misdirected prayers. They have wrong motives associated with them. 
When we have God's heart for our cities and our nation, prayer is effective. Yes. I'm not saying there's not a place praying for your family, your personal needs, or healing, all, all of that, yes. But when the heart cry is, God, we must have more of you yes. and your holy presence. We could be a dwelling place where there would be like an awareness of you over a region, over a city. That's what we're after, God. And church history records, not just what we see in the Bible and New Testament, but where times of visitation, where all of a sudden groups and communities of people begin to pray and say, God, we, and there'd be a holy visitation. Sometimes sovereignly people will begin to get woke up in the night. Just start making their way to churches. I could name revival after revival. Where all of a sudden this awareness of God a conviction of sin is like I, I want to get right with God so in our culture that is post-Christian doesn't seem to have anything morality is just gone by the wayside there's still hope there's still time will we pray our nation is struggling families are hurting our largely anti-biblical culture has brought us to the point of moral bankruptcy. It's affecting every area of society. But there is still time to see our nation change and avoid imploding. Would you go ahead and stand? I believe as we endeavor to be individually the dwelling place of God, not just positionally, oh yeah, that's right, the Spirit of God dwells in me, I'm good. Or I prayed a prayer once, you know, I'm right with Jesus, I'm going to heaven, I'm good, and yet you're living however you want to live. No, 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 no. I, 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 Jesus, I want your manifest presence. I want to know that you're with me. I want to know your gentle voice like I've never known it. God, I want to sense you in a way that would empower me to go beyond who I am. God, I want to walk into places, God, and see your presence begin to minister to people just because you are here with me. I want my workplace to change. I want my neighborhood to change. I want my kids to be so filled with the Spirit of God that they say, God, or, and pastors, leaders, well, when can we get together and pray? When can we begin to have a revival meeting again? And all of a sudden, our gatherings, every gathering isn't just for more teaching. Every gathering is to be in, in an experience, an encounter with the living God. Amen. Where people come in and they say, this is the awesome place of God. And there's a, there's a reverential fear of God on the place. And on the city, when they drive on I-10 through Tucson, they'd be like, I don't know what's happened, but God is here. And the heart cry, I must have more of him, less of me and more of him. That, when God, he's saying, church, I am so ready. Are you ready? And so, Father, I know many in this room. I know them well. They're, we are hungry for you. We want to empty ourselves of anything that would separate us. We want you, God, to fill us and fill us and our heart would be to reach the least, the lost, and the last, God. To go to the ends of the earth, carrying the gospel, the fire of the gospel message in our heart, God. God, a new wave of evangelism would begin to spring out of our churches, God. Signs, wonders. Holy visitation. Jesus had some words for the seven churches in Revelation. On five of the seven, he told them to repent. This is loving Jesus, the sweet Jesus, who loves us so and yet would say, I have this against you. You've become lukewarm. You say you're rich and yet you're poor. You've left your first love. In every case, each of those groups, those communities, repent. Repent! Turn back! So, Father, I, I pray 
do what only you can do in our church in this hour. And so the altar call, whatever, if you need prayer, you might need to just come up here and do business with God. Say, God, I am tired of where I've been at. I want all in with you.